Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I've got it on the line again, uh, Roman in Ukraine, and just want to touch base with him to find out what's going on on the ground, see see how the people are being impacted, and just get a get a quick update from within the the borders of Ukraine. So, um, welcome back, Roman. Thanks for having me. And I want to start out, I understand that you just had an article post over at uh, the Daily Beast, and unfortunately I haven't had an opportunity to read that yet, so if you would, give us a quick overview of, of what the article is about, and I'll, I'll put a link at the bottom of the, uh, in the About section below this video, and grab a couple of screenshots, but go ahead. Sure, well, the article is about Ukrainians' historic role as a borderland and arguing that it needs to remain so. And a part of the audience that I'm engaging is the Ukrainian community in the United States. These are the people I grew up around. Uh, understandably, these people regard Russia as the great evil. You know, they these are people who narrowly uh, narrowly escaped repatriation after World War II. Um, the uh, Allies were sending a lot of Ukrainian refugees by the hundreds of thousands back into the arms of Stalin. So the like. So I grew up among the descendants of that generation, and uh, these people are entirely pro-Western. And my email has been getting, uh, you know, has been getting requests. Uh, you need to call your elected representatives right now and demand intervention in Ukraine. So I was kind of responding to that, responding to this eagerness for Western intervention that exists both there and within Ukraine, although not entirely. I'm delighted to be hearing, you know, we don't need the EU from a lot of Ukrainians who I never expected before. But uh, I make the case that, uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia have a, a border that's 2,295 kilometers long. That's not going to go away. So if right now uh, American uh, young men and British young men and, and, and women and you know, Western young men and women solve the problem that Ukrainians should be solving for themselves. Uh, what about the next conflict? You know, that that Ukrainians and Russians, like it or not, are going to stay neighbors. So, uh, so I think Western intervention would kind of put Ukraine in a permanent state of dependence. And what what also uh, people don't understand is is the ethnic gradient. There are these people calling for for Western intervention. I understand them, but but they're missing also the ethnic gradient that exists in the East. Uh, Ukrainians and Russians have similar cultures. You can argue whether they're just the same people or not. Um, I think they're not, but, but nevertheless, the cultures are very similar. And uh, this is having a huge pacifying effect on the conflict. Uh, where I live in the city of Lviv, the mayor announced that we would speak Russian for a day, and people tried a little bit to speak Russian. In the eastern city of Donetsk, people announced everyone's going to speak Ukrainian for a day. It's the Russian-speaking city in the east, mostly. And there are all kinds of gestures like that. And uh, a foreign army or a heavy foreign hand in this conflict would kind of would ruin that pacifying effect that, that Ukrainians and Russians can achieve on their own. And I make a few other arguments uh, along those lines, too. I quote uh, Lord Byron, the great British poet, he who would be free must himself strike the first blow. Ukrainians need to do this themselves That's if they want to be a sovereign nation. And being sovereign is what it's all about. So yeah, it is. U Ukraine has to remain a borderland. With that 2,000-kilometer border, it's not going to be a Western power. You know, If it's a borderland, it's a sovereign nation. If the West solves this problem, Ukraine goes from being a borderland to being an uh, adversary to Russia. And where where people are kind of related, where people are of mixed Ukrainian-Russian ethnicity, you know, suddenly they're supposed to be enemies. Um, it, incidentally, I was in the American army for six years, and I felt like like I had this effect when I was in Afghanistan. You know, wh when the foreign army was there, when the U.S. troops were there, people had to pick sides. Either exactly. you're against the Either you're you're against the the soldiers or you're with the soldiers, but without that, people are much better at solving their problems. Uh, there's also uh, there's also no historic precedent for the West being willing or able to help Ukraine. 
uh, after World War One, Ukraine Ukrainians fought like hell, uh, both against the Polish forces and against the Bolsheviks in the east. There were two wars going simultaneously. Ukrainians were trying to carve out a, a carve out you know a nation for themselves, uh, and they succeeded for all of three months. There was a, a <laughs> very short-lived Ukrainian country. There were two. There was a separate one declared in the west, and then most of Ukraine declared also a country. Um, but it, it didn't last, and the West um, had no interest in in helping, probably against their their national interest to get that close to the to the Russians. After World War II, there was a, a similar story. So I think Ukrainians e, Ukrainians need to do this themselves. I, and I would I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And when you and I spoke back on uh, February twenty first, mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned. Uh, I believe it was uh, Kalishnikov who was uh, taking kind of the uh, front seat as far as taking power. Oh, and uh, obviously, what's uh, that? <laughs> Kalishnikov is the AK-47. That's the inventor. Of the AK <laughs> 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 similar though. I never appreciated the similarity. What uh, is it? Yeah, what, but uh, what was the gentleman's uh, name? Uh, Kalishko. Klitschko, for a uh, heavyweight boxing champion. Yes. One of two brothers, both heavyweight boxing champions. They are probably the favorites. Oh, it, I'm sorry. He is probably, but Vladimir Klitschko is probably the favorite, the most popular guy among the opposition to be the next president. Uh, what's a little bit disturbing is that the Ukrainian Congress, which is called the, the Rada, uh, they chose uh, a different guy. They chose Yatsenyuk, and that completely jives with that famous intercepted conversation that U.S. Ambassador Victoria Nuland had. She was saying, uh, we don't like Klitschko, we don't like that other guy from the Svoboda party, we should pick Yatsenyuk. So it's a little disturbing to me that so far this narrative has matched, um, you know, that famous intercepted conversation. But, you know, even if the Western powers do affect the outcome, which I think they're going to do, uh, yes. This is not a Western orchestrated revolution, but the West is trying to co-opt it. But even if they succeed, and even if they put Yatsenyuk in charge, I think uh, there are still going to be better things, a better future for Ukrainians, because whatever regime comes next, even if it's as corrupt, and I hope it's not, but even if it is as corrupt as the former one, it'll be limited in that the people have kind of shown their strength, the people have shown their ability to, to throw off a corrupt regime. Which is, which is a very positive thing and which leads me into you you have now have uh, Russia in, in your country in force and I would presume that you have Western troops there either in blue helmets or uh, maybe they're still hiding in the bushes at this point but they're there I mean you and I both know that Western forces are on the ground in your country and uh, how are the how are the people responding to in particular, the Russians, because we know that the Russians are there. They have right. a multitude of troops and weaponry and heavy equipment are on on the ground there. How are the how are the people responding to their presence? Right. Well, I'm not I'm not aware of any Western troops here. I'm sure, like intelligence agents are here. I'm sure yes. the diplomatic missions are here. If there are forces, they are clandestine forces who have so far kept their presence under wraps. And I hope they go away. But how are people responding to the to the Russian troops? Um, well, the headlines have been frightful, and perhaps um, rightfully so. We have the world's second largest army uh, invading another country. But for people that really want to get a taste of of what it what is happening, I recommend tuning into this uh, Vice magazine video that they made inside uh, a naval base in Crimea where you know the the Ukrainian soldiers are all still there outside the naval base you have these like crowds of angry Russians who almost beat up the American reporters they're probably all getting paid in my assumption and inside the base the Russians got in so the Ukrainians decided to put all their weapons in a vault and they're still there they're still in their offices and walking around the base are Russian soldiers right next to the Ukrainians with guns Wow. Uh, 
and it's it, it's it's amazing because they're they're talking to each other, they're sharing cigarettes, the Russians and the Ukrainians. There is no willingness to fight. I'm not saying a big fight can't happen with a provocation, but you know, the further away the West is from this, the less likely a provocation is going to happen. Um, there have been all kinds of gestures against making this a bloody conflict. Um, They're trying. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, no, nobody has been killed in Crimea yet and with this invasion. So Now, how far away from Crimea are, are you? Because uh, I know you're in Lviv. And how far away? And and for clarification, is Crimea is that a, a state or is that a region? Yeah, that's a good. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of far. I think it's like six seven hundred kilometers, uh, maybe uh, three hundred miles away. And it is the peninsula that juts out into the Black Sea. Yes. Uh, it has a really interesting history. For a long time, it was a, a Muslim Khanate uh, allied with the, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ukrainian version of Cowboys and Indians is Cossacks and Tartars. The Tartars were from Crimea. Okay. Um, they were all deported after World War II. Uh, not all, but uh, a huge bunch of them were deported after World War II. Um, it was part, Crimea was part of Russia. People say that under the Soviet Union, Brezhnev gifted Crimea to Ukraine. I don't think it was a big difference. The Soviet Union was one gigantic prison, but uh, one of the, the Russian presidents, I think it was Brezhnev, announced that Crimea would not be part of the Russian Soviet Union, it would be part of the Ukrainian Soviet Union. Not a big difference. Um, <laughs> some people have used that argument that Brezhnev made it a gift to Ukraine. I think that argument is false. Um, Crimea depends on mainland Ukraine for electricity and food, so it's a natural choice. And also, when Ukraine became independent, 54% uh, of Crimeans voted to join Ukraine. It's a very slim majority, but nevertheless, it was a majority in the referendum voted to make Crimea a part of Ukraine. And that kind of leads me into, you've got lights, obviously, you've got electricity, and what's happening with the food, the water, supplies in general, are the supply lines open, and how much uh, are the supply lines being impacted by what's actually happening? Um, very little. Um, my, friend, uh, my friend owns a very small trucking company, and... The day after we talked on February 21st, which was kind of the height of all the violence, it was on the 19th, 20th, and 21st, um, he brought his truck home. He says, I need, to, I need to wait and see what happens. But after a few days, his truck is back on the road. Okay. Um, all public transportation never stopped working in Lviv. The biggest disruption that happened here in Lviv in the western city was that the police disbanded. Um, I think they were under pressure to disband after all the violence that the police exhibited in Kiev. So they disbanded and there were local volunteers um, in these reflective yellow vests all over the city. Um, there was a report by uh, Western media, I think it was on Breitbart, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Breitbart. Breitbart.com posted a story that crime in Lviv actually dropped when the volunteers took over <laughs> the staff of the police. Imagine that, the, um, the people policing themselves and things improve. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, well that's, it's good. good. I'm sorry? Uh, I was going to add the other disruption which didn't quite happen was that the exchange rate from the Ukrainian hryvnia to the dollar, um, it went from about 8 to 1. It rose all the way up to 11 to 1. Um, the best thing might be for it to collapse and for the government bureaucracy to collapse, but nevertheless, now there's an expectation that the World Bank is going to prop up Ukraine. Yes. Not something I'm a fan of, but nevertheless, it brought it brought the exchange rate back down to under 10. It didn't go back down to 8, but it brought it back to, to under 10. So I guess in terms of uh, finance, Ukraines are going to, 
take their medicine in the future instead of taking it now. They'll take their medicine when the whole financial system comes tumbling down, as I think many of our viewers expect. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, the, Christine Lagarde, the, the current criminal in charge of the IMF, I mean, she's she was first one to come out and say that, you know, we need to we need to rush in there and, and help the Ukrainians with their with their finances and yeah. and I'm glad to hear I mean I'm hoping that the the people of Ukraine have a, a little better understanding that whenever the World Bank or the IMF or any of these other central <laughs> bank criminals want to come in that they're there specifically to steal as much as they can period yeah so it's it's part of the conversation uh still a small part of the conversation but but it people are hearing that um i'm doing what i can to spread the message um, i was on tv the other day oh my you okay yeah oh i just knocked over my computer i was on uh tv the other day and i just printed out all these nifty Bitcoin flyers in Ukrainian that I'm going to be handing out. It talks a little bit about competing currencies. So I'm that's, spreading the word in my own little way. That's a good thing. I mean, personally, I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin, but that's a story for another day. Uh, as long as people can get, can protect themselves. And, and, and speaking of which, I mean, what about gold and silver? I mean, as far as the precious metals, I mean, is there any, any kind of, is that part of the dialogue at all? I mean, I know that you're, I mean, obviously, you're going to be talking to people about Bitcoin and, and getting away from, you know, ways that are, are trying to educate people on, on better ways to protect themselves. I mean, will precious metals be part of that conversation? No, the, there's no conversation here at all. It's uh, almost none. There's a libertarian community that, that tunes into all our sources. But uh, so th those guys know about gold. They they know the story as we know it. But you know when I tell people about it, it's it's news to them. For security, most Ukrainians run towards European currencies. Okay. European and uh, American money. Yeah. Well, wow. euros, and dollars. Well, where are they going to go when those when those fall apart? I mean, yeah. that's you know. Well, yeah, it's a pretty safe bet that the Ukrainian currency will collapse first. <laughs> but. <laughs> But it would be nice if they had a longer term vision. Um, <laughs> it would, uh, well, I, and don't take this the wrong way, but I wouldn't expect anything less. I mean, you know, people are people, whether they're in the United States or in the Ukraine, and most of them are, they have the blinders on and they yeah. live in their own little world and that's where they're comfortable. So, yeah. uh, but let's move on. So, so you, how, so you're doing okay, and you're able to provide for your family, and everything's everything's pretty smooth in Lviv. Yeah, everything's great. I'm uh, paying my computer programmers tomorrow. I have a little developing a little bit of software, so yeah, everything's fine. The banking system slowed down. They're capping ATM withdrawals and money withdrawals, but um, it does seem like uh, through through the expected uh, World Bank loan. Uh, they're gonna. We're gonna kick the can down the road, and everything will be all right for now. So, how and what kind of impact is that having on people? As far as and what is the what's the exact amount that, as far as the ATM withdrawals? Um, ATM withdrawals. At first, it was just uh, one bank, just the most popular bank, Privat Bank, and they limited to a hundred a day. Um, a, no a normal salary in Ukraine is like. Uh, like uh, five hundred to a thousand a month, so hundred a day isn't that bad for for Ukraine. Okay. Um, and when I was making a, a cash withdrawal from a wire transfer to pay my programmers, um, I could take out fifteen thousand, uh, fifteen hundred dollars a day. And that's U.S. dollars or Ukrainian? U.S. dollars, yeah. And the transfer took forever to get here too, so I was actually late, but they understood. So it really doesn't. It doesn't sound like that. It sounds like life is pretty normal. Everything is moving along. There's some some minor inconveniences as far as being able to get money, you know, yeah. or not money but currency, um, yes. and and to be able to conduct business. I hear that for for you and and for everybody there. And yeah, yeah. What what? And the last question that I, that I want to ask is is same one that I asked you the last time. 
and what do we need to know about what's happening on the ground in Lviv and, and, and around uh, your immediate area to better understand how the people are living their lives uh, inside of this situation. Well, aside from the need to tune in to SGT report, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, can, you can also visit my blog, uh, RomanInUkraine.com. Um, I guess that there's a lot being made. There's a big, like, social media is, is such a big part of this. Uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of propaganda and counter-propaganda from both sides. One myth that I think has been dispelled from everywhere is that this is some kind of, like, Nazi fascist movement. Um, that, that's a ridiculous claim. Uh, and so that so I want to address it. The well, we are we are hearing just now. Hold on, and we are hearing a lot of that from a, a number of sources that there are Nazis that are on the rise. That there are some very hardcore, over the edge um, groups that are that are coming into the forefront. Right. Well, let, let me let me just cite some of the evidence. Uh, the head rabbi of Kiev had an interview that I posted on my blog. He said there is no serious anti-Semitism. He says, in fact, it's it's much worse in Russia. Um, another guy, Ihor Kolomoisky, he's a Ukrainian oligarch. He's also head of an organization called the European Jewish Community. He was just made governor of uh, one of the big industrial regions in Ukraine, Dnipropetrovsk. He was just appointed when he was like a, when he was made governor. He gave a long discussion of, of how ridiculous these claims are. Obviously, he's Jewish. He's head of this huge European Jewish organization. Uh, the new prime minister Yatsenyuk. I don't think he's a practicing Jew, uh, Jew but he has Jewish roots. Um, so a lot of Russian. Oh, there was a well-known Russian nationalist. Let me see if I can find his name. Boris Mironov. Uh, he also had a a lecture that I posted on my, or he made a big statement that I also posted on my blog. He said the Western Ukrainians are not nationalists, they were fighting the Soviet Union. Um, so all over social media there's a lot of accounts of both Russians and Jews exposing this propaganda. Uh, it seems to come a lot from the Kremlin and I think uh, it's coming it's coming from some libertarian sources, which I love those libertarian sources and I was so so uh, disappointed by their coverage. Uh, I think it comes from two places. Um, like for a long time, for a long time, the press supported the Soviet Union, and they supported the idea that any resistance to the Soviet Union was fascist and Nazi. Um, that was that was made loud and clear. So the the longer the Soviet Union went on and suppressed Ukrainian nationalism. Like the more you heard crimes that expressions of Ukrainian nationalism was all all fascist and Nazi, but there's just so much, so many Russians and so many Jews saying that this is crazy. Oh, I also posted a picture on my blog: a uh, Ukrainian flags flying in Israel as a show of solidarity. Okay, um, I, I think the I think the the claims are ridiculous. Um, I would recommend Timothy Snyder's book. Uh, Bloodlands. It was uh, a book that describes the plight of people trapped between Hitler and Stalin. Um, the the grain of truth around which uh, these stories are built uh, is that when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, uh, Ukrainians and Russians as well joined the invading Nazi army by the hundreds of thousands. Um, general officers, their staffs on down, all the propaganda officers, like whole Russian military units and Ukrainian military units switched over and joined the invading Nazi army because they had lived in the Soviet Union. You know, they, these are the, you know, in the 30s, uh, as many Ukrainians were killed in the Great Famine as Jews were killed in the Holocaust. And that wasn't the only tragedy that happened under the Soviet Union in those years. Now, the, the legacy of those Russians who joined the invading Nazis was wiped out because the Soviet Union had an iron grip in Moscow. Here in Ukraine, their legacy kind of lived on because in Ukraine, armed resistance to the Soviet Union lasted for another 10 years. 
so it, it's viewed like that as a little bit like the Nazis were the enemy of our enemy, you know. Yeah. And I think Europeans are very uncomfortable as they're they're meeting a people for whom World War Two history is not so black and white as it is in the West. But but the claims that the protests are defined by fascism are ridiculous. Like there's one the most nationalistic party is called the Svobodov Party and its leader Oleg Chagnabok is usually shown as like evidence of, you know, that the protests are, are fascist. Well, first of all, Oleg Chagnabok has no standing with the protesters. He's not popular among the protesters. It was just a scandal where wounded protesters went on television and saying, hey, the Svoboda party used our image saying that, saying that we were members of their party and that were injured in the protests and we were never members of that party. So you, what you see is this supposedly nationalist party trying to jump in front of the parade. It, it's not defining the protest. That's the first thing I'll say. Second thing I'll say, Oleg Chaknabok and the Svoboda party are not radicals. Yes, they're a little bit nationalist, but Chaknabok has repeatedly made statements about protecting minorities in Ukraine. He says, Israel is an example of the type of nationalism that I want for Ukraine. I want a homeland for Ukrainians that also protects minorities. So he is by no means, like, I, I want to know if, if somebody watching this knows Justin Raimondo or, or, or Scott Horton, like, what do they think, what do they think these protesters are going to do? Do you think, like, besides the word neo-Nazis, which isn't an accurate description, do they think they're going to invade Poland next? Do, do they think they're going to start pogroms? I mean, the, the chief rabbi of Kiev says, it's completely fine there. He says it's better in Ukraine than in Russia. So I went on maybe a little bit too long, but I'm trying to trying to correct what I perceive as a as an inaccurate coverage. Well, and that's what that's what I appreciate is the fact that you do explain what we need to know. I mean, it's you have to understand. I mean, is more than likely it's the same thing that you're experiencing. I mean, we've got this this flood of information. Yes. That is that's trying to direct a particular narrative, and yes. I just want to cut right right to the chase, and that's why I'm, that's why I have you on the line. I mean, you're there, you're among the people, and that's what that's why we're having this conversation is so that to help to clear some of the smoke, to help to to shed some actual light from from within. I mean, you're just a you're just a, a a person just like me. You know, you're trying to get to the truth. You're trying to deliver the truth. We can't do that if we don't have this. If we don't have a conversation, if you and I, you don't go on and explain the history and, and explain who these people are and why they're doing what they're doing, and we're left with the narrative that we're getting from wherever it's coming from. I mean, and it's not that I don't appreciate all the reporting that's going on, but it's gotten to the point where I look at it and go, well, maybe not. Maybe that's not right. You know, not according to the source that I have that's right there. He lives in Lviv. He's right. a Ukrainian. He's, you know, he's a born national Ukrainian. He's an American citizen also, and that's not what he's saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, please don't 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 apologize for trying to educate because that's what it's all about. Life is too short and life is too precious for us to not get to the truth. We've been lied to all of our lives, period. Yeah. And it's time to have the truth come out. Enough for me. So. I, I really appreciate your time, Roman. Very grateful. Very, very grateful that, that we have the the opportunity to speak. I really am. Well, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, have me on again anytime you want. Well, we'll do it again real soon.